Hello, and welcome to a special interview presentation sponsored by the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society, the Real American Revolution, and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my co-host, historian Christian Despigna, author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's Lost Hero. Now, our guest today is historian John U. Reeves, author of They Were Good Soldiers, African Americans Serving in the Continental Army, from 1775 to 1783. Now, John's been writing about the common soldier's experiences in the war for American independence for over 30 years on subjects ranging from army food and the soldier's burden to women in the army and military vehicles and watercraft, producing over 150 monographs on these subjects. Now, for 15 years, John served as military food columnist for the quarterly newsletter, Food History News. He also wrote four entries for the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, 13 entries for the a revised Thompson Gale edition of Boatner's Encyclopedia of the American Revolution, and has contributed to Gastronomica, the Journal of Food and Culture, also to Military Collector and Historian, Muzzleloader Magazine, and Repast, uh, quarterly publication of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor. So, John, welcome to the program. And Christian, let's welcome our guest with the first question. Thanks, Randy. Thank you You're getting much. us all hungry with that. Um, <laughs> but John, let's start out with, with, with something that I was curious, right? We, I know you spoke at uh, Randy's Roundtable in Williamsburg last year. And one of the things I wanted to ask you then, I didn't get a chance, was really what inspired you to write They Were Good Soldiers, African-Americans serving in the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783? Well, it was, it was a little bit of serendipity. In fact, it was a lot of, a lot of serendipity. Um, I started researching uh, about 1986 or so, uh, and I was researching on, on, a, on a single subject, but I kept on coming across information that I thought was interesting. So I would, I would set it aside, for, possibly for future use. I, I didn't know what it would lead to. And eventually I started become, uh, getting more and more information on uh, African-American soldiers in the war. Um, so if you fast forward to the 2000s, I had enough that I finally had had enough to, that I thought to, that I could write an article. I ended up writing two articles. Um, one was an overview. The other one was on uh, uh, black soldiers in, in Southern Continental Regiments. Um, and then uh, being on LinkedIn, um, I got a message one time from a, uh, an editor from uh, England uh, for Hellion Press. Um, and they, I had posted a couple more articles and they said, uh, would you like to write a book for us? Um, you could write it on the subject of African Americans in the war or anything else you wanted to. And I have, I mean, I have a ton of subjects I, I, I could have written on, um, but it, I really didn't think long before I realized I wanted to write on African Americans. Um, I just thought it was, a, was a subject that really was worth, worth doing and, um, I, I just wanted to get the information out there, especially for, especially for black, black American citizens, you know, young and old who don't know the story, but, but for everybody, really. Right. And I, and I know you did a lot of research. Tell us about some of the primary sources you used when writing the book. Well, I, I was hit, hit and miss at first. Um, occasionally, I would come across the, a, a pension by a black soldier during the war. Um, and when I wrote my second article on uh, black soldiers in Southern Continental Regiments, I used, um, uh, it's called the, the Southern Campaign Pensions. Um, I can't remember the name of the two men who have, who have that website. They're all available online. The pensions are all transcribed. They're fully searchable. Um, and they're, they contain uh, soldiers who either were from the South or fought in the South. So it's, it's a nice selection of pensions. So I use that, as I said, for my first article. Now, when it came to my book, I thought I need to figure out how I can get as many African-American pensions as possible. You know, I, I, I couldn't just use the Southern site because that was only uh, for the Southern campaigns. Um, I kind of you know, search around. Eventually, I, I, I uh, fell into Erd Grunset's, it's called Forgotten Patriots. It's a DAR publication. Um, and that's available online. You can uh, download it, which I did. It's searchable. Um, but wait, basically, what I did is I went, went all the way from the beginning to the end. And it's it's, it's uh, separated by state. 
um, or territory. And uh, I went from, you know, just one at a time. And, it, and the, the nice thing is they, they uh, tell whether a soldier had a pension or not. They, they include all the sources for that soldiers, that, 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 that each soldier, but they tell whether they have a pension or not. So I was able to go in, figure out which ones had pensions. And I basically looked at all the pensions. Um, and I was interested in soldiers with good stories to tell. Um, and that's, that's basically how, how I did it. Interesting. Well, John, let's give our listeners a view as a sense of the numbers of African Americans involved in the Revolutionary War. Now, we know that before, well, around 1770, total population in the 13 colonies was about 1.6 million white, you know, uh, individuals, while the Black population was around 468,000. Um, Ten years later, by 1780, the white population was about 2.6 million, and the black population was about 566, so or 21 percent, uh, many of whom, of course, were enslaved. How many African Americans actually fought for the British, and how many actually fought for the Americans? Okay, this is where we get into, esti into estimates, and um, the best estimate for the American side, for the continental side, um, would be five to seven thousand. Okay. Um, that number has been floated around for a long time. Sometimes I think it's much less. Sometimes I think it's probably accurate. I, it's, it's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, for the British side, that's even more difficult. Uh, I've heard estimates anywhere from 10 to 20,000, um, 10, 15, 20,000. I really don't know how accurate that is. Um, the, the 1783 Book of Negroes, which is basically a book it was created by the, the by the British High Command that listed all the uh, African Americans that were being um, evacuated out of New York uh, to mostly to, mostly to Canada. Um, the the best copy of that contains three thousand names of African Americans. Um, that's men, women, and children. Now, on that, uh, about four hundred were loyal slaves, so they would have been retained as slaves. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll pick it up when it comes back up. Yeah. Please, because the, um, so it, for the British side, it's, it's really hard to tell. I would say at least, at least 10,000, if not 15,000. Okay. Now, how many of those who were enslaved really fled to the British lines when the opportunity came up? Any, well, any guess on that number? Again, numbers are really hard to come by, but um, possibly thousands, definitely hundreds. Um, they, they fled into British held New York. Uh, right. they, they fled to, to, to moving armies. So in, in the South, when, when the army was on the move, they fled to Cornwallis's army. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, they fled into Charleston, Savannah. Um, yeah. and of course, you know, slave, slave owners did everything they could to keep their slaves from running, but, but it, it wasn't always of possible. Course. Well, that really leads us into this next question. I mean, we know that there were two major proclamations that were issued at the outset of the war and then full throttle in, in 1780, possibly more proclamations, but they triggered enslaved uh, individuals to seek their freedom. The first was obviously Lord Dunmore's proclamation of 1775. And then a second, of course, was uh, Sir Henry Clinton's proclamation of 1780. Uh, they were similar in some respects, but what were these two proclamations specifically, and how do you distinguish between the two? Well, they, they were both very pragmatic. Again, they, they, they weren't done with the idea of, of abolishing slavery. They, they weren't done out of, out of the goodness of their hearts. They were basically done to hurt their enemy. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that slaves received their freedom because of it was a, was a byproduct. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first one um, was basically done on, on, uh, on John Murray, uh, Lord Dunmore's, um, on, on his own, basically. Uh, he, he was only the commander on the spot, um, and he had been raiding plantations along the coast and, uh, and was basically taking slaves off the plantations, just, just as he took other, other um, property off the plantations to hurt the, you know, to hurt the rebel cause, to hurt, hurt those, those who were going against the crown. Uh, eventually, he he thought that he would make use of that manpower and and uh, and form those uh, the male slaves, the able-bodied male slaves, into a uh, into a regiment. Um, and that that struck light lightning like lightning uh, all over the colonies from north to south. 
um, because this, the last thing the, uh, the, the quote unquote rebel slave owners wanted to see was, was um, the British freeing their slaves and then basically, and then turning them, turning them against them. Uh, the um, Clinton's, Clinton's uh, proclamation is, is interesting um, because it contains, it not only states uh, officially because he was commander in chief in North America at that time. Um, so it, it, it was, it was, it was a, an all encompassing um, crown supported uh, uh, declaration. Mm -hmm. Now he, he was accepting any, any slaves, any uh, enslaved Africans um, into his lines and he would uh, feed them, give them work. Um, but also as a codicil to that, he, he also threatened that he, uh, any slaves or any blacks, not, not slaves, but any, any African-Americans taken captive while they were fighting for the, uh, for the rebel cause, for the Whig cause, they would be uh, enslaved in turn. So if they were captured, they would, they would be made slaves. Okay. So that's a, that's a, a, a real turnabout. Um, mm -hmm whether whether he really honored that uh that last statement in the breach whether whether he ever did it um i don't really know i in all my pensions all the pensions i've i've seen in my experience uh the black soldiers were taken prisoner and kept in kept in prison one one black soldier from rhode island i think it was claimed that he was taken prisoner and made a slave mm -hmm. um so at least one man was enslaved after, after his capture uh, okay. But it, it didn't seem to be, you know, all encompassing. Sure, sure. Thanks, John. You write that uh, you know, really unknown to most Americans, that African American uh, African Americans were involved in the early stages of the American Revolution. So, can you tell us about their involvement a little bit? Well, especially, I mean, the the war <laughs> the war started in the north. I mean, of course, April nineteenth, seventeen seventy five, Lexington conquered. Um, at least the the war, in fact. Uh, on that first day, um, African Americans were fighting, and that, that's that's both free and enslaved African Americans were, were fighting uh, against the British on that first day. Um, a number of them were actually in action. Some some were based one some were in the, in the militia but never got into action. Um, and one of them, uh, Prince Estabrook, was actually uh, wounded on Lexington Green. So that that would have been the very first action of the war. Uh, they went on to uh, fight at Bunker Hill. Um, some 150 African American and Indians uh, were Bunker Hill. Uh, less would have been fewer fewer Indians, but the, the service of Indians and African Americans is is somewhat tied up um, because Indians. Some Indians were also enslaved, and in, when the Rhode Island Regiment uh, decided to um, change to being an all black regiment, they accepted Indian slaves and African American slaves. So they're 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 somewhat tied up. But uh, but at the battle battle of Bunker Hill, about 150 uh, fought that day. Right. Um, they yeah. were they were part and parcel of the New England Army. Uh, and during that first year of the war, there was there was a a, a debate um, whether to allow them to serve. Now you know it's given that they they, they fought from the first and they fought well. Uh, commanders say that. Um, but first, the provincial provincial uh, legislature of Massachusetts uh, wanted no slaves in the army, um, and then it, then the the Continental Army decided to uh, the high command decided to bar all all blacks to all the blacks altogether. Now, while while this debate was going on, the blacks were in service. They they were they were with the regiment, so they they were never barred from the army and thrown out. Um, they were serving this whole time. It was basically a war on paper. And by the end of 1775, beginning of 1776, Washington and Congress relented and, and basically allowed, allowed uh, mostly freed uh, blacks to serve. Um, enslaved blacks did serve in smaller numbers, but they did serve. Right. And, and let's talk about these New England regiments, because initially your focus is on British involvement with African-Americans, and mm -hmm. then you shift the narrative to American and New England regiments. So... Some Americans know about the first Rhode Island Regiment, but exactly how many African American regiments were actually established during the war? Well, on the American side, the, the only black the only black regiment was the first Rhode Island, and that was um, the first Rhode Island came into existence at the beginning of 1777. So for 1777, it was an integrated regiment. At the end of 1777, beginning of 1778, they 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 needed manpower, so they decided to 
take the command, command staff from the 1st Regiment, send it back to Rhode Island, so they formed an entire new 1st Regiment with only black uh, privates. Um, and they were commanded by white officers and white non-commissioned officers. So from, 17, some fe from se February 1778 to July 1780, the 1st Rhode Island was a segregated regiment with only, only black, black and, and Indian privates, uh, private soldiers. Um, in July 17, 1780, basically the regiment was all but disbanded because it was so under strength. Um, they only had two large companies. Uh, so then that was all that was left. It was two, two large companies of black soldiers. Um, and then by uh, about early part of 1781, it was sent um, south, uh, actually sent to, sent to West Point and where it was merged with the second Rhode Island. And from that point, it became the, uh, the single Rhode Island Regiment. Um, and from that point on, it had two, two all black companies uh, and six all white companies. Um, so that's the black regiment uh, for the American army. There were two other black regiments during the war. One of course was um, Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian regiment. Uh, that only lasted a year. It was formed in November, 1775. Um, and actually probably, probably started uh, being formed in August, 1775. And it was disbanded uh, about August of 1776 when it was sent north to New York and, and disbanded in New York and never, never uh, reformed. Um, and then in 1779, there was the, uh, let me, let me, let me get this straight because it is, it is in French. Um, the uh, French military formed the uh, Chasseur Volontaire de Saint-Domingue, um, and that unit was formed in what we know, now know as Haiti. It was formed from uh, both free and enslaved uh, Africans, um, and that served from uh, 1779 to the end of the war. Um, their first major action and probably, probably really their only major action was, was that, um, was in autumn 1779 at the Siege of Savannah, uh, where they, uh, where they, they actually saw pretty heavy combat. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, in the American army, the rest of the units were integrated. You know, there were, there were, there were black soldiers fighting alongside white soldiers. I mean, black, black and Indian soldiers fight alongside white soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, in the British army in 1777, uh, uh, William Howe, so William Howe, then, um, then commander in chief in America, decided to bar um, blacks from serving in loyalist regiments. They, they really weren't serving in British regiments, except, except as drummers, musicians, also servants and also wagoners. Um, so any, every African Americans who were, were, who were in loyalist regiments up to that point had to be, had to be thrown out. Now those are those are loyalist regiments that were on the establishment. There were also irregular loyalist regiments and militia. Blacks did serve in ir irregular loyalist regiments and loyalist militia regiments, but they didn't serve in the in the uh, loyalist regiments on the establishment. Um, they also served in uh, in German regiments as musicians uh, and also as uh, as wagoners and uh, pack horsemen and also servants. Um, so so they were spread around, but in the in the in the Crown forces, most of the African Americans did not carry muskets. They were not combat personnel. They were they were either laborers, uh, they were servants, um, they were uh, they were wagoners, uh, pack horsemen. Um, there was actually one one British unit, the the uh, Black Pioneers, which was actually a, 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 a pioneers were were military laborers, uh, mostly for fortifications, but they did other things too. And that that pretty much lasted through the war. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> well, John, how were they treated? Uh, how did the, uh, did the British commanders treat African-American soldiers any differently than American commanders? Well, there weren't that many African-American soldiers, um, but the, the few there were, especially, um, they seem not to have been treated differently in loyalist regiments. In, uh, it's interesting because in the regular regiments, as I said, they're, they're mostly either musicians or wagoners. Mm -hmm. And they were treated. They were treated very well. And as far as I know about the musicians, um, pre-war in Boston, uh, I think it was the 29th Regiment, which was stationed in Boston, the 29th British Regiment. And the locals were horrified because it was the duty of the of the musicians to meet out meet out punishments. In other words, they 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 were they were uh, in charge of floggings when a soldier was supposed to be punished. 
So the, the citizens in Boston uh, were horrified when they noticed uh, a punishment in a British regiment. And it was a white soldier being, being flogged by a black musician, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, which was totally unheard of. Uh, I mean, they, and they write it, they write about it, the period. I actually, I actually include uh, a couple quotes in my, in my mm -hmm. book. Um, yeah. So they, they, by and large, were, were treated, were treated uh, pretty equally. Mm -hmm. same, same as in the American army. Mm -hmm. um, they were, I mean, at the most basic level in the Continental Army, they were given the same food, the same uh, clothing, the same equipment, um, the same pay. If you if you compare it to the uh, the Negro regiments in the American Civil War, one of the biggest contentions with the, with them was they were in the American Civil War in the eighteen sixties. They were being be, be, being given less pay than the white soldiers, and that was not the case for the black soldiers in the Continental Army. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found no, no differential treatment uh, that that I can, that, that I can uh, tell off really. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I personally found some of your personal observations in your book, the writings, the narratives, you know, describing the battles and events and conditions in camp, very fascinating. Which one did you enjoy the most researching? Um, well, one of the ones that I most enjoyed researching, and it didn't all get in the book, was uh, was the story of a Connecticut soldier who served late in the war. He actually may have served earlier, um, but we, but we know he was serving. He was in the Continental Regiment starting in uh, uh, March 1781, served through to the end of the war. And while he basically saw, um, <coughs> while he basically saw uh, post or his. His service was, was in military posts, uh, West Point, um, uh, Peekskill, and other points in the Hudson Highlands. Uh, his, his wife also um, served with him for three to four months. Um, and she got smallpox while she while in the service. And if anybody's read of smallpox, that's it's a horrific, uh, horrific disease. Um, mm -hmm. I actually just took that, the information just in the pension file, and I actually turned it into a small, bi small biography uh, it's, uh, it's called Judith, Judith Lines and his name, his, his name was John Lines. Her name was Judith. And it's, it's called Judith Lines and an unremarked life. And basically it's my attempt at a biography of Judith and John, but, but to, to basically from, from birth to, to death. Um, mm -hmm. and it's just all based on the material in the pension files. The, um, the most singular thing about that one, because there, there's a lot of great accounts, uh, but the most singular thing about that one is the, the fact that uh, in the pension file, she included a letter written home by her husband. Um, and it was when she was home, she at that point had three children uh, by her former husband. Um, she was taking care of the farm on her own. Um, and he writes about the conditions in the, in, in the army. At one point he writes, the, he, was, he, had, he was living on, he, he had to live for eight days on bread only, um, which for anybody familiar with the Continental Army, that's not that, not too surprising, um, but he also asked about how about several things about about the house and you know how she's doing and uh, mm -hmm. and just the the soldier letters are, are very common soldiers letters are, are very rare anyway. Um, so mm -hmm. that the fact that that was from a black soldier home to his wife was uh, was pretty special. Mm -hmm. Well, I noted also in your book that uh, you mentioned African American women who accompanied the army. Well, tell us about them. That's rare that you hear about uh, African American women. Accompanying the army. Uh, could you give us a little insight there? Well, I, I first started researching and writing about Af or about about women with your army in the in the 1990s, and I've I've written a number of a number of articles on uh, on them. Um, but when when I first and actually for a while I was I was aware of at least one African American woman, and, and it comes from a runaway ad. Uh, her name. In the ad was Rachel, but she had previously been, been called Sarah. So when she ran away, she changed her name in order to not to be not to be found. But they they caught her. But the the ad, the ad talks about uh, that she's a mulatto woman. She's pregnant. Uh, she has with her her son Bob, um, and she was in the first Maryland regiment for a good portion of 1778, and pretended to have a, a, a husband in the, in the in the regiment. And at some point, she must have thought that uh, that they were um, that somebody was getting close to catching her and she left the regiment. Uh, and actually in my book, a friend of mine um, 
Brian White actually did a, an illustration based on that. Based on that, it, it actually says her her son has light colored hair, so he was he he had blondish hair. Um, there's another woman, uh, Hannah Till, who actually was a, a cook for uh, Washington and later Lafayette. Um, and while in the while with Washington's uh, military household uh, at Valley Forge, uh, she gave birth to a son. Um, and about a year later, she purchased her freedom because part of, she she was out of Boston, um, and her master let her keep some of her wages, and she she actually put that towards person purchase her freedom. And then of course there's Judith Lines, um, you know he was who was in with with the army only for a few months. So you run the whole gamut with with women that are uh, with, they're with the army for a long period, um, and some you know women who had had. Uh, families in the army, they gave birth in the army um, to women who were only with the army for a short portion. And I, and the title of my book is is African Americans uh, serving in the Continental Army. And I don't, I, I purposely did not say African American soldiers, African American men, because even though it's only in, in an appendix, I, I wanted to include women in there too. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and John, we know you did a deep dive into the research, so. Was there anything that you came across that you found shocking or surprising that you didn't expect? There's a lot of great personal stories. Um, one of them was Jacob Francis, who uh, was not enslaved. Um, he was from New Jersey. He actually, I, I, live, uh, I live on the Delaware River, uh, north of Philadelphia. He actually, he actually lived right across the river from me. Um, he was an indentured servant. Uh, he was his indenture was sold and he was taken up up to uh, new england went to went with his master to uh, the caribbean came back to uh, new england was his indenture was sold again um and at 21 years of age his indenture ended so it became free so he's from new jersey in 1775 he ended up joining a massachusetts regiment so that massachusetts regiment went all through the new york campaign and eventually ended up in the battle of trenton Right after the Battle of Trenton, his, his the, the time it was a one-year regiment. He was discharged at Trenton, and he went back home. Um, and then he served in New Jersey militia for the rest of the war. After the war, um, as I say in my book, he 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 struck another another small blow for freedom. Uh, he he actually he actually purchased the freedom of he he married a, an enslaved woman in another household, um, and he purchased her freedom after their marriage. Mm. Um, it's just a really interesting story, and then and then his, uh, um, no, I'm I'm actually I'm, I'm actually mixing his his story up with Judith Judith Lyons because Judith Lyons actually later on writes about uh, that her son Benjamin was uh, wounded and died of his wounds received at the Battle of Chippewa. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there there are these stories about family, sometimes not directly connected with the revolution, that are really interesting. There's there's man, there's uh, soldiers who talk about being born on the ship over, coming over from Africa, on a slave ship, being born on a ship, or or remembering you know coming or, or uh, coming over as a child on the ship from Africa, um, and you know these these men became soldiers later. The uh, as I said, enslaved men did serve in in New England by and large, not always because it wasn't really written in stone, but by and large, enslaved soldiers who served in New, served in New England. Were given their freedom for their in a re response in, um, in reward for their service. Um, in Virginia, slaves were serving; they were supposed to, but they did. And uh, right after the war, they they uh, passed a passed an act that would uh, give any slaves who had served as soldiers uh, give them their freedom. So there, even nor north and south, there was there was a recognition of enslaved soldiers' service. Mm -hmm. um, right. There, there's little things like. Uh, like slaves having their names changed. I mean, it's it's pretty common for slaves. If you if you're purchased by somebody, sometimes you would have your name changed because there are already too many bends in the household. So they would they would just change your name on a whim. Um, some of them had their had their names changed. They were they have a name changed, assigned by officers. Uh, some changed their name after they were um, after they were uh, freed. So which which was a it was a real symbol of their new freedom. They, you know, they, they had the right to choose their own name. Um, and I, I was really surprised with the number of men who, who had name, change, name changes during and after the war. Um, little, little things like that. It's, it's, just, it's just really fascinating. Right. 
And so let me ask you this then, you know, what, what's the hope for the book? What's the major takeaway that you want readers to walk away with after they read this book? Well, one of the things is, you know, there are several. One of the things is that uh, if you would read their accounts, you would not know they were African-American soldiers. These, these, they had the same experiences as white soldiers. Um, you know, they saw the same service. They suffered the same, uh, you know, the, the, the same trials Fortune. and tribulations. Um, they, they enjoyed the same bounty when, there, when on the odd occasion there was bounty in the army. Um, so they, they were soldiers. They weren't black soldiers. They were soldiers. Um, you also see that uh, the effect of slavery on these soldiers. Um, some of the men right in the 19th century had enslaved family members, like enslaved wives and children who they could they didn't have the money to purchase them uh, and they were free you know the soldier was free or the veteran was free himself but but his family was enslaved um i mean even during the war <coughs> there was one rhode island soldier um he was a freedman he uh he was coming back from yorktown with his regiment he was in in uh, delaware actually maryland head of Elk, maryland and um the men in the house he was uh, he was staying in where they were assaulted by a, a sea captain and and part of his crew. Well, in defend, defending themselves, uh, this man actually shot and shot and killed the uh, sea captain, and he was tried by a local court, a civil court, not military, civil. Um, he was tried for murder, but he, he was convicted of manslaughter. Um, he was sentenced to be branded on the thumb, and he was ordered to pay court charges. Now the same case had the same case had. Uh, basically a, a mere case had been brought against a soldier in Rhode Island and that man was let go after he paid the charges. Um, this man, a black man, and bo both were black men, um, this man, since he was black and he could not pay the charges, the, the Maryland Civil Court decided that in order to, uh, to pay the charges, he would be enslaved. This is a free black being enslaved in return for charges he could not pay. Now, so there were differences because if he was a white soldier, he, he would not have been enslaved. Um, so, you know, when push comes to shove, you know, they can be treated equally in all other ways. But at that time in America, you know, if you were black, there were some things that happened to you that could not happen to a white soldier. Right. Mm -hmm. or, a white, wow. or a white citizen. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, John, it's been a real pleasure having you with us today to join Christian and me to talk about your book. Thank you so much. Well, very interesting, very enlightening, to say the least. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's really, it's really great to see you both. I, uh, I hope we can get together, uh, you know, face to face soon. And, and I really appreciate you um, asking me to do this. Thank oh, you. absolutely. Thank you. Well, to our listeners and viewers, thank you for taking time to view or listen to our program. Our guest has been John U. Rees, author of They Were Good Soldiers, African Americans Serving in the Continental Army from 1775 to 1783. Please remember to subscribe to our Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society YouTube channel. And on behalf of my colleague, Christian Spigna, and myself, we'll say so long for now.